Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. And I'm Tracy McRae. After a cold, dark winter in this northern frozen tundra, <laughs> most of us can't wait to feel the warmth of the sun on our skin again. Whether it's for spring break or maybe prom, some people try to get a jump start by going to the tanning bed to, finger quotes, get a little color. But at what cost? Some of us are born with that natural yeah, color, Tracy. Yeah, lucky. According to a new study done by researchers from the University of North Carolina, roughly 263,000 skin cancers occur in the U.S. in 2015, and these were attributable to indoor tanning bed use. And these were attributable, and these were attributable to indoor tanning bed use. Interestingly, the, their treatment cost more than $340 million. Ooh. Here to discuss the dangers of tanning beds is Mayo Clinic dermatologist Dr. Don Davis. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Davis. Thank you, Tracy and Sanj. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. I feel like we just have to ask you, tell us about tanning beds, and then Sanj and I could just leave and go have cupcakes or something. Absolutely. <laughs> well, dermatologists feel very strongly about tanning beds, and we're making very good strides in the political world with the federal government having them outlawed for minors and hopefully eventually for all adults as well. Several states already have uh, laws against tanning bed use for minors because it is so dangerous. So first of all, it's labeled by the World Health Organization as a carcinogen. And so the warning labels will now be on tanning beds, which is very important for people. Now there are warning labels on cigarettes and all sorts of other things that are bad, so it doesn't necessarily say that the warning label will stop people from using tanning beds, but hopefully at least it will be a pause moment where people will consider it. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we used to say in pediatric medicine that television was the cheapest babysitter, and it's easily and readily available. And I think that a lot of parents expose their children and themselves to tanning beds because it's cheap and easy to do and readily available and it's purely easier to bring your child along if you have a tanning bed appointment and so what I'd like to suggest is there's no harm in wanting to have a tan on your skin but just do it in a healthy way. Well I was going to say and that's the problem is that people consider if you are tanned it makes you look healthy. Correct but dermatologists will tell you that if your skin is naturally not a shade of brown it's not meant to be that way and if we can remember back to the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, actually having tan skin was a sign of unhealth. And unfortunately, with society progressing, it, it's gone the other direction. Now, Dr. Davis, I've learned of a new phenomenon, but it, I guess it's not new, that people, before they go on vacation, they pre-tan. <laughs> now, I thought that was the whole point of vacation. So it's can you explain right. this pre-tanning phenomenon to me? Yes. So pre-tanning is a common cultural fad where people have the impression that if they tan their skin with light, in some form, either natural or artificial, before going on a vacation somewhere south or where they will get more sun exposure, that it will decrease their risk of burn and decrease their risk of skin cancer. And they call it a base tan. Correct. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is not true. Mm. So um, there's no such thing as a healthy tan unless it's an artificial tan that comes from a spray or a lotion. So I always tell patients, it's not a sin to want to look tan. That's totally fine with me. If you want to get a tan and you want to favor, you know, favor yourself and take yourself to the salon, just get a spray tan or buy self-application self lotion. It's much safer. It contains dihydroxyacetone, which is simply a stain, which now comes in a variety of colors that look ap appealing to the skin um, on your surface. And it lasts about 7 to 10 days on average to the average person. But when you go and you get a tan, it doesn't prevent you from getting a sunburn. And it only adds time in the bank where you've had ultraviolet light exposure to increase your risk of skin cancer. So because tan is damage, tan is not health. Correct. So there's two forms of ultraviolet light that can cause skin coloring, UVAB and UVAA. So UVB and UVA. UVB is what causes immediate darkening. So you go out in the sun for a couple of hours, and within the next day you can tell that you are tan. Um, UVA is long wave light and is the prolonged light that gives you the delayed tan over several days time. So that's the cloud. That later. You and cloudy days. Correct. Yeah. So um, that long wavelength can pass through window glass. So it gets into your house and your cars. It can um, pass through clouds. So it can occur during cloudy days and you can still get sun exposure and skin cancer risk. And the other thing is that ultraviolet light is a wavelength of light. And based on our physics classes in high school, we know that light bounces off reflective surfaces like snow and water and sand <laughs> and concrete. And so if you're sitting in a swimming pool or on the beach, um, you know, you get twice as, twice as much light because you get the light that comes directly towards you 
and then you get the reflected light off of the surfaces that are near you. So now as all of us are coming out of hibernation uh, and hitting the golf courses, etc., what should we be doing to protect ourselves from the sun rays? For example, suntan creams. Yes. So the first thing about suntan creams is I like to remind people that no one has enough natural SPF in their skin to not require sunscreen. It's very common outside of the Caucasian community and the skin of color community of all sorts of cu cultures to believe that they don't need sunscreen because they have natural color. But studies have shown that at best, the absolute darkest patient only has an SPF that is natural of equivalent to about SPF of 12, with the average oh. patient of color having SPF 3 to SPF 12. Mm -hmm. And that's not even where we begin our recommendations, because we recommend SPF 15 for daily use and SPF 30 at a minimum for outdoor use. So with regards to gradual sun exposure, your skin has been naive over the winter and has not gotten a lot of casual contact from the sun. And so just make sure that you're very good about using broad-brimmed hats, sunglasses that also have UV protection because some of them do and some of them do not. And that not only protects you from cataracts on your eyes, but it also protects you from skin cancer on your eyelids and on the skin surrounding your eyes, which is very important because it's thin skin and it's hard to reconstruct. And we want you to look pretty <laughs> if you have a skin cancer that has to be cut out. But make sure that you start with a high-numbered sunscreen. So start with something that is SPF 30 to 50 and reapply every two hours or if you get sweaty or wet. And what about lotions or sprays? Because Dr. Kakar over here has got four kids. Yes. And what are you going to want to do, Sanj, is just to line them up and go with a spray and just spray them all down when you go to Florida. That's what we do every day. <laughs> is that good enough? Yeah. So I tell my patients, I want you to use the sunscreen that you like best, as long as it's broad spectrum and it's at least SPF 30. And if people prefer a spray to a lotion, I'd rather them use a spray than nothing at all. A couple of key facts are that the average person only uses 30% of the amount of sunscreen that is recommended. So if you're using an SPF 15 sunscreen, odds are you're only putting on a third of what's recommended, which means you're only getting SPF of 5. Um, the other fact that we know is that spray sunscreens do not go on nearly as evenly and as uh, completely as lotion sunscreens. So you really have to shellac someone <laughs> as if you're spray painting your car a new color <laughs> to truly get the coverage that a spray would give you. When I spray my family members, if they insist on the spray, <laughs> usually after one Dawn Davis application, they are right back to cream because it really is an impressive amount of aerosolized liquid that has to come out. You really feel like I am spray painting you. <laughs> wow, I'm sure you all un underdo that. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Dr. Davis, is at the swimming pools I see in the summer, the adults, uh, the men, for example, are wearing shorts, and mm -hmm. yet their kids are wearing the tops and the shorts. Right. Should, th should the adults be wearing the, short, uh, the tops as well, or are they immune to this? Yes, yeah, so um, fortunately, adults protect their children, but they also should protect themselves. And so um, we need to show, first of all, good model behavior for our kids. But second of all, yes, adults should be just as covered as children. Um, their skin is just as friable and vulnerable to the sun. And the, immuno, the immune system that circulates to the skin as we age is not as viable as it is in children. So I'm always proud when I go to the pool and I see people with their hats and sunglasses, but it is important to wear clothing um, to protect yourself. And now that there's UPF or universal protective factor clothes, you can get them in fashionable patterns for reasonable prices that are long sleeve, short sleeve, tank tops, shorts, uh, skirts, and long bottoms. So yes, if you're not putting lotion or spray on it, it needs to be clothed. And I think the final thing I've learned from you is taking care of that sunscreen when you're carrying it along with you. Yes. So um, sunscreen expiration dates are not a myth, and they're not a marketing ploy to get people to buy more sunscreen. Firstly, a bottle of sunscreen should only last you three to four applications if you're applying it correctly, because one shot glass full of sunscreen should only cover your naturally sun-exposed areas when fully clothed, which is your face, your upper neck, your decolletage, and the dorsal hands or backs of the hands. So if you consider how much sunscreen that is, and if you're outside at the pool for a day or golfing with your shorts and short sleeve t-shirt on, a bottle of sunscreen is only gonna last about three to four good applications. So you really don't have an excuse for it to expire or to be ruined by weather. But if you do put it in extreme heat or extreme cold because you leave it in your trunk and it's 100 degrees outside, you will sizzle the chemical components that make it work and it will be ineffective. 
We've been talking about the dangers of tanning beds and the importance of sunscreen with dermatologist Dr. Dawn Davis. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Davis. My pleasure, Dr. Kekar.